Okay, um, we're gonna begin the lecture tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Evan Douglas. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I'd like to say a few words about our inaugural uh, Global Perspectives Lecture tonight, sponsored by my Dean's Leadership Council. On June 10th, in response to the brutal and senseless killing of George Floyd and the subsequent uh, Black Lives Matter protests that emerged throughout the US and abroad, I issued a public statement as the Dean of the School of Architecture to our entire school community, voicing my grave concern about the obvious and repugnant systemic racism and injustice that the black community continues to endure as an oppressed people in the US today. I felt it was imperative as an academic leader and a role model to to speak out to our students forcefully in support of the spontaneous sense of outrage and anger expressed around the world concerning the immoral character of our nation and the urgency for radical change. In support of my call for action, my Dean's Leadership Council, comprised of some of the school's most respected of alumni, issued the following public statement, and I quote, as witnesses to the intolerable acts of injustice and other atrocities against individuals of color throughout our lives and our nation's history, the members of the Dean's Leadership Council of the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute School of Architecture wholeheartedly endorse Dean Evan Douglas's June 10th, 2020 message to the RPI community. We extol this message throughout our nation and the world because it represents both the depth of anguish we each feel and our collective vision for an equitable future. The council is committed to the continued development of a civilized virtuous society. To demonstrate our commitment, the council fully funded the inaugural year of three initiatives that directly supports the full participation of the school's students of color in the academic and professional service arenas vital to their lifelong success. The first one was the annual student diversity scholarships, which we intend to launch momentarily. A support for NOMIS, the school's chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architecture students and an annual Global Perspectives Lecture. Furthermore, we each will work to foster diversity and equity within our respective organizations. As a result of their determined and passionate desire to make a real difference regarding the creation of a more inclusive community throughout our school, and in recognition that all of our students will one day go out into the world as future leaders with the potential to contribute to a more fair and equitable society. My Leadership Council now serves as the primary sponsor of this important annual Global Perspectives Lecture. On behalf of the entire school, I wanna thank them for their generous support and heartfelt advocacy for meaningful social change. And now we turn over to this wonderful lecture tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, the internationally acclaimed architect, urban planner, and renowned change agent, Maurice Cox. Most architects aspire at an early age to a career comprised of a collection of distinguished works that serve over their lifetime as an exquisite embodiment of their unique creative vision. The projects often emerge as discrete buildings activating their respective sites on a variety of important levels while also contributing to the overall vitality of the community. The promise of the sole practitioner is certainly a noble endeavor, 
that continues to serve as one of the primary models of developing our built environment and our sense of community around the world today. Set in stark contrast is the far reaching impact of a visionary urban planner like Maurice Cox, someone who interprets the city as a vast interrelated dynamic social, technological, infrastructural, and economic network capable of transforming the lives of millions of people in urban centers around the world. It's an inherently interdisciplinary project of enormous ambition and complexity requir requiring extensive community of intellectual and creative expertise from a broad spectrum of disciplines to adequately assess and actualize a responsible and meaningful vision for the new city of the 21st century. With that context in mind, Cox has dedicated his entire career to developing innovative organizational models for revitalizing some of the most important cities in the US today. At the heart of his efforts is a firm belief that citizen participation design excellence and the role of a sustainable economic model are vital to the success of any urban initiative, as well as the long-term agility and strength of any inclusive urban community. Unlike the master builder model associated with the late 20th century urban developer, Robert Moses, whose top-down hegemonic approach was fiercely criticized for subjugating its human inhabitants to the sovereignty of the car, Cox has always envisioned the city from the start as a living democratic enterprise in support of imbuing principles of inclusivity and equity within the ethos of our urban environments. A brief overview of, of his career achievements. Uh, prior to his recent appointment as Commissioner of the Department of Planning and Development, DPD, for the City of Chicago by Mayor Lori E. Lightfoot in 2019, Cox was the Director of Planning and Development for the City of Detroit, where he led one of the most ambitious and celebrated urban revitalization plans in the history of the U.S. His genuine passion and commitment to the design of cities can be traced to his visionary oversight as the former design director of the National Endowment of the Arts under President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama, where he represented the federal government for architecture and urbanism in his influential role as an advisor to more than 120 mayors on urban design issues. Cox also served as the mayor of Charlottesville, Virginia from 2002 in 2000, 2004, following six years as a city councilor. As an elected official, Cox implemented numerous innovative community processes and strategic planning initiatives that resulted in Charlottesville's consistently high ranking as one of the most livable cities in the United States, as well as the smallest city in the country to maintain a triple A bond rating for excellence in fiscal management. He also chaired the city's Housing and Development Authority Commission, Metropolitan Transportation Planning Organization, uh, and the Mayor's Task Force on Urban Housing Policy. While dedicating most of his career to the development of urban life, uh, Cox developed his belief in the larger value of public service during his time as an educator and as an administrative leader. Uh, Cox is a former professor at Syracuse University the University of Virginia and Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. He is also the former Associate Dean for Community Engagement at Tulane University and the former director of the Tulane City Center in New Orleans. It's a remarkable career and an extraordinary testimony to a beautiful and impactful life of advocacy and creative and social engagement at all levels of public service. His efforts as a visionary leader have resulted in the thorough reassessment of the design of the American city today, which in turn has contributed to the resurgence of public life in communities throughout our urban centers. 
And for that and more, he deserves our highest respect and deepest gratitude. Um, on a personal note, uh, for full disclosure, uh, Maurice and I have known each other for a good, a good portion of our entire life. We were uh, fellow classmates and good friends uh, back at Cooper Union. Oh my God, in 1979, 80, 83. <laughs> and I just, you know, I wanna um, share with the audience tonight um, that it, for me personally, it has been a remarkable opportunity to see a close fan, friend and a colleague uh, uh, move forward uh, and take an extraordinary journey through their life. Uh, and evolve into, into someone that, I mean, he was always special, but someone that has had a profound impact on the lives of others. Um, and Maurice had always been, even back in those early days, an extraordinary uh, designer, creative individual. And he's, and he's moved that creativity as, as implied in my uh, introductory remarks into the idea that you can organize coalitions, you can bring people together from all different disciplines and walks of life in the purpose of something greater. Um, and that is community. And I can't think of, of anyone that I'm more proud of, uh, not only because he's a friend, but because he's given back something to society basically throughout his life. And, uh, he's recognized uh, the, the power of leadership. And I say this from a, from a benevolent and humanist standpoint, the opportunity afforded leaders, given the right vision, to really give something back to society. And uh, kudos to my friend and, and, and kudos to the, the current uh, uh, director of city planning at in the great city of Chicago. And we're thrilled to have you uh, share your story uh, and your journey with us tonight. Uh, to everyone, I give you Maurice Cox. So, wow. Um, wow, Dean Douglas, Evan. <laughs> Thank you um, for uh, that amazing um, journey through uh, um, our, our friendship and uh, my career, um, it is very unusual that someone can say that they've known you for over 40 years. Uh, and um, we, uh, we drank from the same inspiration, uh, the same inspiration that uh, shaped a, a leader uh, like uh, Dean Douglas. Um, um, I, my origins are there as well. And uh, John Haydick is probably that um, element who inspired us um, to be leaders in whichever path we chose. Uh, and uh, I, um, when I look back over um, careers uh, like your own and mine, I see that common thread, uh, a spirit that was alive and well at Cooper uh, that got embedded, and here we are, uh, 40 years later, uh, uh, staying true uh, to those uh, those those initial that initial impulse uh, to be innovators, to be change agents, uh, to be leaders. Uh, so, uh, just thank you again um, for for an invitation to do this uh, lecture, uh, and it comes uh, at an extraordinary time, right, uh, in our country's uh, history um, and uh, the um, awakening that we've seen uh, nationally um, that has shaken every corner uh, of our discipline. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it feels, it feels um, rewarding to know uh, that something that you've dedicated your life to, and that is the pursuit of equity and excellence and inclusion um, that there is a groundswell now um, and our discipline, the discipline of architecture and design 
is hearing it uh, and every institution uh, is assessing and reassessing uh, how we create a more equitable uh, and just um, world uh, through our piece of it, through the built and natural environment. Um, so uh, just thank you for the invitation. Um, and I also, um, you know, I've been uh, in Chicago for a year uh, now, and uh, it's probably one of the most um, extraordinary opportunities that I've been given uh, over the course of my career. I mean, it's Chicago is in a beautiful city of, you know, uh, 2.7 million people, the third largest city in America, um, going through its own uh, a, a reawakening uh, where um, equity, uh, inclusion, diversity, resiliency is at the core of the aspirations of uh, this mayor. And I feel very, very fortunate to try to realize uh, a bit of her vision uh, in this city. Um, but, you know, I spent five years on the Detroit project. Uh, and so it is uh, dear to me uh, and uh, I can begin to see the fruits of my labor there. And so I actually wanted to focus on Detroit because uh, I think it's an extraordinary case of um, and a challenge to our discipline um, to go to a place uh, so extreme um, and, and look for an opportunity to innovate. Uh, and I'm kind of, I, rem I remember something that uh, John Haydick said uh, to us uh, when we were really young designers. He, he encouraged us, he implored us to, to go somewhere uh, that no one else has been and do something that no one else has done. Uh, and I just remember that um, as an invitation to never um, shy away from what appears to be the impossible uh, and go, go there and commit yourself uh, to bring the kind of um, lens of innovation uh, to that particular case. And so Detroit um, still stands as uh, a, a extraordinary model and I, I'll try to cover that and I'll be happy to talk about my journey here in Chicago afterwards. So I'm going to um, uh, share the screen for a moment. Um, and let's see, uh, full screen. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, looks great. Okay, Mark. great. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit just about what it means um, to try to capture the spirit of a place, um, what it means to uh, um, talk about the restoration of a place uh, and Detroit's story, I think hopefully um, will resonate with, uh, with you and inspire you. Um, so let me just see if I can get this all to work. Uh, so um, many of you know uh, Detroit as uh, the home of uh, Motown, uh, um, a music, the birthplace of a, of a music that really identified a generation. Um, and uh, Marvin Gaye's song, Mercy, Mercy Me, um, was written in Detroit at a time where, we, where there was the emergence of the uh, environmental movement. Uh, and he saw it as a, a movement of justice. Um, and what he was talking about was the uh, degradation of the, the built and natural environment. Um, and the loss of the industries uh, where um, the, uh, the city uh, that literally invented, uh, reinvented uh, the assembly line uh, and modernized manufacturing um, was laying in waste, um, houses, uh, by the tens of thousands abandoned uh, as the jobs left. And um, a population loss 
uh, over a million uh, two over the course of 50 years. Um, and the reality of what it means when uh, uh, an urban pattern is scarred um, and broken uh, and how you could possibly have a regenerative um, period when the country in many instances um, had left the city for dead. Uh, and I was always taken by this quote in a national paper that said, uh, would the last person out of Detroit please uh, turn out the lights? Oh wait, uh, it's too late. Um, so what we we're seeing uh, as recently as 2012 was this type of fetish that we, we thought we might actually see the first great American city die in our lifetime uh, and the implications of that. Uh, but you know, D Detroit uh, had to hit rock bottom before it could find itself in a place of innovation. Uh, and that rock bottom was um, in 2013 when the largest city in America filed for municipal bankruptcy. Uh, un unable to pay its bills. Uh, and at the same time, they elected an extraordinary political leader in Mike Duggan, who was determined to find a way to restore this city uh, and to use its hardship as an opportunity to reinvent uh, the American city. And I was very, very fortunate uh, that he called me to be his partner in that effort. Um, but it was no uh, small feat. Um, it, um, the bankruptcy involved over $18 billion in debt, um, over, uh, under just under 40% of the population lived in poverty. 40% um, of the street lights uh, didn't come on, oh, apologies. Um, uh, at night, uh, and um, it had every social ill that we associate um, with uh, distressed urban uh, environments. So this was uh, the place in which uh, Detroit um, had to be reinvented. Uh, and this mayor um, believed that if we could get the city functioning again, that we could pose to Detroiters um, what kind of city it wanted to be, because everyone in Detroit knew that the city would have to be uh, reinvented. And his notion, as was mine, that we could build you know, one city uh, for all of us uh, and that we were going to attempt a redevelopment strategy like none other in American history. Uh, and that's an amazing uh, challenge for a city, one of the poorest cities uh, in America uh, to state. Uh, and it's also the largest majority uh, African-American city. Uh, so imagine going to a place that is <laughs> come out of a bankruptcy uh, is 80% African-American, it's a poor city, and to set a vision that we were going to help reinvent the American city. Um, and we were going to do that with those who stayed, that 680,000 people who uh, were determined to stay in the city that they loved. Uh, and his charge to me was to, to weave their narrative, their stories into this revitalization, uh, which meant spending hours and hours and tens and tens of meetings with folks, understanding why they stayed, what their love of this city was all about. And if I, as a designer, could tap into that, um, we could write a new chapter. Um, and the other 
thing that was uh, perhaps not known to many people is uh, you're, you're looking at just a sampling of why they stayed. Uh, we had only seen, uh, you know, the, the images of physical decay and abandonment, but all throughout the city were dozens and dozens of neighborhoods that were gorgeous, uh, that represent uh, the most stable of residential fabric that I felt we could build from. And so we began to look at these healthy parts of Detroit and find ways uh, to kind of envelop them in a new framework. Uh, so it's about a restorative process. And with restoration, um, you have to look towards um, that which regenerates naturally. Um, and to do so in a way that acknowledges that resiliency, health, uh, and beauty would be a part of a growth strategy and that that growth strategy um, would be inclusive of everyone who was there. Uh, and that lace in that would have to be an opportunity, an economic opportunity for those who stayed. And that design, the design process would have to be a part of creating an atmosphere of trust. And that we needed to go beyond inclusion, that we needed to talk about equity. Uh, we needed to talk about ownership uh, in any recovery and that it would have to be driven uh, by the citizens who live there. And so that was the challenge. Um, and it inherently spoke to a kind of democratic process, if you really think about it, the idea that anyone and everyone has a right to live in a socially, economically, environmentally well-designed community. This was affirming a, a democratic right. Uh, and I have come to think of democratic design as being about the ability to mobilize people to tackle really tough challenges that they faced in their community and to be generous and empathetic enough to give that work, that design work back to the people who are directly affected. Um, and uh, then, uh, which is often the hardest part, uh, to problem solve according to their values, uh, not ours. Uh, and uh, I've often used this uh, South African slogan uh, that talks about nothing about us without us is for us. And I try uh, to live that every day when I work uh, in communities like Detroit or Chicago or New Orleans. It fundamentally suggests a willingness uh, to meet people where they are. Uh, if it means going into the backyard, uh, as we did here, uh, of a, a trusted community leader uh, as a safe place um, to engage people, then that's where we would go. Uh, so, so much of the work of uh, bringing a community along is um, meeting them in a space that they control, uh, that they feel comfortable in, uh, as you begin to bring the tools you have um, to the table. And, um, you know, Detroit is a, a show me uh, kind of town. Um, it's, it, it's hard to talk to folks and get them to open up to innovation and new ideas without uh, testing some of those ideas. And so I became a very big advocate of, of pop-ups, of tactical approaches that demonstrate the change uh, that um, I am advocating for. And as people embrace it and test it, uh, they become more open uh, to that change. And then at the core of this is a belief that design uh, really, really matters. Uh, and that in order to have people um, value design, it has to be a place where they can reach it. And so, but my, um, desire has always been to infuse design excellence into the everyday life of a community, 
to make it accessible and reachable to them, to have conversations every day about the importance and value of design as they become advocates for their own um, neighborhoods through design. And the important, um, when I talk about uh, making design excellence um, a conversation, it's convening, facilitating, exposing the way we work um, as, a, as a normal part of um, trying to interpret a community's desires. Uh, and it means, uh, it means a lot for people uh, to be engaged in, a, in an aspirational conversation, in a conversation that's uh, about innovation. But it is um, no small feat, there's no small territory. And uh, this map that was generated by another architect colleague of mine, uh, who's the Dean of the University of Detroit Mercy, Dan Patera, uh, to get a, a sense of just how immense Detroit is, this idea that you could fit the city of San Francisco, the city of Boston and the island of Manhattan into the 139 square miles of Detroit. Uh, it um, with uh, only 680,000 residents from a peak of 1.8 million and that the land um, and that the kinds of um, remnants of that history, um, again, by the thousands uh, kind of dot the landscape. But the important um, aspect in terms of the opportunity of Detroit uh, was the 24 square miles of land, which is publicly um, owned and vacant. And so the areas you see in yellow and red are uh, the areas that have the highest degree of vacancy. And so we, 24 square miles is, is a lot of public land. So much so, uh, if you think about it, it is larger than the island of Manhattan. And this was uh, what fascinated me. What could you do with um, your ability to manage uh, that amount of land. Now, again, it doesn't come to us contiguous uh, uh, like a Central Park. Uh, its pattern is um, this mosaic of occupancy and vacancy. But you'll see uh, in one, one block, you will have an entire uh, row of houses. In another block, you'll have two or three. Uh, and so this particular pattern um, was really the opportunity as I saw it. How do you regenerate a neighborhood where every one of those houses, every one of those families stay in place? And what kinds of patterns, uh, new public scapes might be generated um, through uh, this um, land pattern? And the fact that the land effectively was regenerating itself. Uh, this, the foreground of this image um, looks incredibly healthy. I mean, it could be a rural landscape, but this is only a mile and a half from the downtown. And so I began to look more deeply at this space uh, and understand that um, first of all, the, the, the landscape was going to be uh, the generator of the new urban form. Uh, and so as you see um, a lot that is regenerating, uh, there's dumping on this lot, um, there's no one that cares for it. But I found that the moment you found the juxtaposition between habitation um, houses occupied, that people naturally began to take care of the land uh, um, adjacent to them. In fact, often there would become productive landscapes. People started to, to grow things. People started to mow those lawns. People started 
um, to occupy space in a very, very different way. Um, and that I felt was perhaps uh, the place where we could start, that there was an inherent care for the land. Um, and like Mrs. McClinton, who would get on her power lawnmower uh, and she would cut the land around on her block. Uh, so she became a steward of the land. And so I started uh, reflecting on what could happen if we allowed each Detroiter to be an equity investor uh, in the revitalization uh, of their neighborhood. I mean, what form of collective ownership could we forge um, to take advantage of the fact that these residents who stayed were, were natural stewards and how to do so in a way um, that would signal um, that the land uh, was for everyone. Uh, and what you see here uh, is the Detroit River uh, and the riverfront. And I'll talk a little bit about because it, it was one of the first efforts um, that I was able to lead to help take um, this derelict industrial landscape that you see on the left um, to a place where um, it was evidence of a kind of regenerating um, civic realm. And so the reality um, is again, in order to um, help people understand the power of a public landscape, um, there had to be a public convening. Uh, and with the work uh, with my partners at uh, Skidmore and Murrow, who were the urban designers of this, uh, and uh, Michel Devine uh, from Paris, the landscape architect, we began to think about a kind of public landscape that would um, give significant parcels that were planned for private development, as you see, uh, to snatch those back and make them places uh, that were collective. Uh, and to do so in a way that introduced uh, residents to a new type of landscape, um, a natural landscape, um, one that um, was characterized by wetlands. Uh, and so a place where someone fishing would be just as comfortable as someone taking a stroll uh, with their, their latte. And the opportunity was this, uh, you know, I looked uh, at, at landscapes like this and, uh, you know, the normal reaction of a designer is to fill it up with buildings. Well, uh, that did make a lot of sense in Detroit. Uh, because we had tens of thousands of empty buildings. So the answer really had to look at how we could regenerate this vacant land um, through a uh, land form. Uh, and through the work of Michelle Devine, the landscape architect, we imagined if every parcel that was vacant was then a part of a regenerative, restorative uh, landscape, and that the uh, public realm would be concentrated uh, by this um, promenade along the river's edge. Uh, and then using uh, transit uh, down a major boulevard as a place to cluster the development, not on the river, but in an urban um, kind of armature that um, Jefferson Avenue, as you're seeing here. And then to try to imagine a landscape that would be absolutely surreal for uh, the average citizen who would come from their neighborhoods to get back to a kind of natural state uh, along the river. Uh, and this would then um, support the creation of density uh, around the, this um, great central park. Um, and anticipate a future uh, where buildings help to shape this big civic uh, living room. Um, 
And we were able to get this model um, adopted. But the thing that really always amazed me um, was when we showed these images uh, to residents, um, there was a deep appreciation of nature uh, and a deep acceptance of urban edge making um, buildings that would define the city's edge. And then the thought of how do you connect this um, into the fabric of neighborhoods that followed that were just outside of the riverfront. And we identified a series of Greenway connections um, and the Duquindra cut is one below grade. Joseph Campo is above, above grade that would invite neighborhoods to have um, pedestrian and bicycle access um, to the riverfront. Uh, and that we would further connect um, 10 neighborhoods as far away as eight mile to the river through a 31 mile bike and pedestrian loop across the city. And we would go even further, we would name it, we would tag it culturally after Joe Lewis, uh, the boxer who was an amazing athlete and uh, citizen of Detroit. Uh, and this simple notion of knitting the city together, not by car, but by bike and foot in a city like the Motor City uh, was considered absolutely radical. Uh, and here is what I had to work with. Already, uh, this Dequindra cut, which cut uh, below the, um, the street level by 20 some odd feet had been repurposed for a couple of miles uh, and became a kind of greenway that led to the river. And in fact, it um, <clears throat> became a place, you know, of uh, recreational um, civic activity uh, where we would create uh, container pop-ups and there would be uh, major slow rolls. Uh, so this habit of getting around by bike um, really um, created a culture in and of itself. The, the largest bike ride um, in the country happens in Detroit. It's called the slow roll. Uh, and literally thousands of people come and uh, slowly have a kind of rolling party uh, through the city. Um, and it has generated a whole culture of, uh, of um, innovation around bike design. Uh, and uh, the most recent is one of the largest indoor velodromes. Uh, so, you know, you can take uh, something um, like an asset like that uh, and drive it uh, to create a new culture uh, and to drive a different type of development. And so the next step was the, the absolute um, beauty of living next to an amenity like this. Uh, and why is it a question of equity? Um, so in Detroit, as you can see, um, the areas in the light violet um, are areas uh, of low income, uh, 27,500 um, uh, per household. Uh, and the level of car ownership where we had up more than 30% of residents who did not own a car uh, within a half mile of this greenway that we uh, created. And not only that, the a vast majority of that vacant land um, was clustered around this greenway. So we could in effect assure the long-term affordability of a, something of such a, a kind of catalytic uh, a piece of infrastructure. And so um, <clears throat> we began to really uh, have a, a, a citywide conversation uh, and uh, go about strategic, the strategic perp, um, purchase of railroad right of way. 
And uh, this greenway will be one of the longest uh, when it is complete um, of its type in the United States. So I have always been interested in um, these kind of found landscapes, uh, this kind of, this is an existing condition uh, along one uh, point in that landscape. Um, and we began in this past year, um, the work has been completed in defining each um, character of this greenway that ultimately will lead uh, to the riverfront. But I was interested in it for a number of reasons. Also as a driver of revitalization, uh, an attempt to um, create uh, an interface between urban form and this um, nature. And the first uh, project of, of uh, redevelopment along this greenway is now underway. Um, and it purposefully tries to organize a series of public spaces um, along the greenway that signal a kind of mixed use uh, community. Um, it's a five acre site. The goal of this first development uh, by um, uh, the architect CTO um, <clears throat> is to create a, a public realm that mediates that 20 foot um, elevational change uh, and that um, housing would envelop it and a uh, pavilion would sit uh, at its center. So um, a lot of work on the heart of the city, uh, but, but really um, the, the soul of uh, this city is in its neighborhoods. And I found that to be true really across the country. Uh, and here is the, the, the proposition. Could we create a, an urbanism um, from the landscape? Could we organize this new Detroit around the landscape form rather than the building form uh, and use that uh, as a way uh, to knit the city together in an archipelago uh, of landscape? Uh, so the areas you see in yellow are the areas where we would concentrate um, concentrate the um, density of the neighborhoods and the blue is the landscape that we would use to hold those urban centers together. Uh, and so um, this was a growth plan uh, for uh, Detroit and I'll take you through four because they're always uh, landscape based so you can see um, how um, that, that is realized. So uh, I, I came of uh, age professionally in a time when we drew. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I uh, would draw uh, every day uh, this uh, big map uh, that would be hanging in my office. Uh, and I purposefully assembled a group of designers, urban designers, architects, landscape architects, uh, city planners that worked interdisciplinarily uh, to find these um, opportunities uh, within this kind of immense geography. And uh, I also um, felt it was really important to bring um, world-class designers and in effect uh, to lead um, with landscape architecture uh, from Walter Hood, uh, uh, to Michelle Devine in Paris, or Elizabeth Moss up in Australia, um, or uh, Pete Odoff in the Netherlands, um, using um, some of the landscape thought leaders globally to reflect on a new typology for uh, Detroit. And what you see here are a set of the strategies. We basically um, took uh, given geographies of the city and um, brought together interdisciplinary teams of architects, urban designers, and landscape architects to figure out a quarter square mile strategy. And we would each one designed by a different cohort. And we would then go about implementing these experiments. Um, 
and we um, committed to 10 and they were all being designed by different entities. They all were a quarter square mile and they all had um, hundreds of citizens participate uh, in reimagining their neighborhoods. And I'll take you through a few of them. So uh, this, was, this was called the tree nurseries of Rosa Parks. Uh, this particular area, uh, and it was designed by uh, um, Hood Design and uh, the landscape architect Dan Reedon in the planning department. And it was trying to reimagine um, what would have happened if uh, after the uh, 68 riots uh, in Detroit, which were in this area, if we could create a regenerative landscape there and to um, convene those who stayed uh, in a series of meetings where we brought some of these amazingly talented designers to have a conversation about not rebuilding uh, the neighborhood in terms of vacant lot um, construction, but instead um, a conversation uh, about a new type of industry, uh, a, a, an agricultural uh, industry uh, that could um, both provide jobs, but also um, create um, a regenerative landscape. And so um, there are a number of experiments in this space. Uh, so it was not totally new uh, to Detroiters. Uh, one of the largest urban tree farms, uh, Hans Nursery uh, is in Detroit. So we were interested in taking that model and seeing what it would mean to create uh, an economy where the vacant parcels of the neighborhood effectively became uh, a tree nursery um, that both ordered and patterned the landscape, but also employed um, residents in jobs. And so um, it's kind of like the, uh, your, your garden center, but taking over um, the vacant land in between uh, houses. And so in this case, the architect had to not only you know, partner in creating this framework, but we also had to figure out the, the business model that would employ people. Uh, and we ended up getting um, a rural tree farmer who knew how um, to run a nursery, uh, training uh, residents in this enterprise. Uh, and the model was, um, again, designed by Walter Hood with a series of typologies that would order the landscape. And they were inherently spatial, whether they be rose or border or glen, um, but they would be productive. Um, and so the first of that um, nursery was conceived here where the houses were repurposed uh, as those um, kind of community owned um, nursery buildings. Um, there would be an aggressive border treatment of permanent trees and then the productive landscape or the commercial landscape would be at the center. And so we're talking about contexts that look like this that were being reimagined um, as um, landscapes of order, but productive landscapes, but accessible, uh, that paths would weave uh, through the neighborhood and just restructure how you, you uh, navigate uh, public space. Another um, model was at the Eastern Market um, it's a food, one of the uh, largest food production and distribution centers in the Midwest. Um, and bringing together um, MVVA, uh, Michael Van Volkenberg, uh, and UTIL, uh, Tim Love out of Boston, to explore what we would do if uh, we could expand an area just east of the market center. Um, as a place for um, uh, a expanded uh, Eastern market production. So the floor plates 
of these buildings uh, get very large and how you could take this former residential area and create uh, a fabric that again allowed um, uh, residents um, to understand the power of possibly you know, um, stormwater management, but turning it into something uh, that could be regenerative. And again, you know, these are aspects of the design process that very often we would not expose to ordinary, you know, people. Uh, but I was determined in my work uh, that we could break this down and, and help residents understand some of the most complex concepts uh, and they would become uh, the advocates. Um, and so the, the idea was very simple. Um, the use of these half mile long um, tree gardens that would manage the stormwater and structure the public space and allow for the production of food and the distribution of food to be managed in the bands um, between the, the tree, the linear tree gardens. And so here um, is one, again, um, vacant parcel uh, and how it might be reimagined as a stormwater garden uh, and uh, the kind of ways in which one would move through that space safely. Or this idea that these large plate production spaces might be juxtaposed to live work spaces um, across the alley. And again, having a variety of those scales coexist. Um, and then there was the project of the home and gardens of Fitzgerald, which was one of the first ones designed by uh, Spackman Moss of Michaels uh, and the talented landscape architect, Alexa Bush uh, in my office. Uh, and this one was, could we imagine a neighborhood where over 400 vacant parcels could be repurposed into productive lots, into a park, and could we go in and renovate a hundred homes that were previously vacant? And again, um, this idea of the model, could you renovate a house, tie the vacant land next to the house, um, um, specify a flowering meadow garden, and that um, developer would renovate the house and own the parcel next door eventually that might actually support infill development. But in the meantime, it would be a thing of beauty, a thing that would be performative. Um, and develop a typology, just as you would a building typology um, for every type of lot in the neighborhood. So some would be um, hubs of activity, some would be urban ag, others would be performative uh, flowering meadow gardens. And the houses were very, very simple. These are houses that, you know, sold for $50,000, but to renovate them uh, and uh, um, bring them back and tie them to the land next door. And the, just as important, this notion of using and educating uh, a workforce um, where uh, the people who tended to, to those uh, vacant parcels or those gardens were people um, from the, the community uh, being educated in green collar um, jobs. Uh, and I, and I, I, I put the number of meetings uh, that it took to get to this place uh, on the screen because this process involved uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of teach-ins. Um, but one of the um, most uh, fantastical aspects of this project was the creation of uh, a two and a half acre park at the center of this neighborhood where we assembled 27 vacant lots, did a little bit of demolition and tried to see if we could create a park um, that was more than a park uh, that crossed alleys and streets uh, and had a kind of cohesion to it. Um, and in fact, uh, this park was built, designed by um, uh, Elizabeth Mossop. Uh, and it has a couple of inventions that 
uh, have proven immensely successful. Um, one is this idea of blurring the line between street uh, and parcel, uh, creating a place where young men feel completely welcomed in a public space with a full court basketball court in the same geography where um, young kids might play. Uh, and this idea of somehow culturally tagging this um, in a manner that residents had complete ownership of it. Uh, and so the name of the park is Ella Fitzgerald Park. Uh, and it was based uh, in the pattern you see on the street was an interpretation of one of her, her uh, songs, uh, Dream a Little Dream with Me. Uh, and bringing into it um, uh, an artistic expression. So you see this 125, 20 foot long um, ceramic wall um, that is an expression of hands and the community uh, designed and built uh, together uh, with them. Um, and so this notion that um, those areas would then be connected through the vacant lot and create a kind of passage, um, a kind of pensive um, connection from one part of the neighborhood to another, uh, a very different way of engaging that public space. And so um, it's uh, a, an experience of trying to weave uh, equity uh, into every aspect of, um, of the design process. And I, you know, feel strongly that there is an explicit connection between using um, this process um, of a regenerative landscape um, together with a process of um, um, a process of community ownership. And I am, uh, I want to, um, I feel like I, uh, I should tee up the effort that I'm engaged in uh, now in um, Chicago. Um, I'll take, I'll do it briefly, but it, it presents a very uh, different set of challenges, but uh, an important, I think, uh, counterpoint. Um, and so once again, this notion of an interdependency between uh, a city of vibrant core, uh, like the loop in Chicago, um, but to understand that there is a direct connection between the health of the downtown and how you might tie that to neighborhood regeneration. And so what you're seeing here is a pipeline of buildings in the Fulton market um, that the city has crafted in a manner that additional density, a bonus is given there that gets transferred to uh, the neighborhoods. And I'll show you how, once again, a crafting a strategy that makes the connection between a downtown and neighborhoods. And in the case of Chicago, it's centered around um, a, a really transformational investment uh, that the mayor of Chicago has marshaled called Invest uh, Southwest. And that is an investment in the South side and the West side. And it is like Detroit identifying those neighborhoods on the South side and the West side uh, that have within them the opportunity to reimagine what uh, an urban neighborhood is. In this case, around other assets like historic buildings and transit, which is the kind of armature of the strategy in, um, in Chicago. But it starts again with this, I, this absolute belief um, that um, development can be done equitably. Uh, and that growth can happen inclusively. Uh, and uh, the mayor would often say, you know, it's not a, a result, the status of those city, uh, those neighborhoods, it's not a result of a lack of 
public investment. It's just the investment needs to have to catalyze uh, private investment. And this is really what she set out to do. Could we marshal um, the resources, and in this case, $750 million, um, and focus it across all kinds of departments to have a catalytic impact. Um, and that 250 million um, that you see at the base is within the Department of Planning uh, to manage. And could you do it around lifting up, once again, the assets that those communities have, uh, like this uh, bank building that might get repurposed? or bringing together needs, both of housing, and in this case, a library, uh, to create a new um, mixed use building, or investing so fiercely in a local, um, in, in creating local wealth um, by reusing assets that are owned by community organizations, and then imagining a different framework for public safety. So in order to do that, um, I, once again, I had to kind of map and remap the city uh, into seven uh, regions, uh, much like uh, Manhattan has, you know, like New York has five boroughs, uh, and assigning to each one uh, a team of designers. Uh, and I, over the course of this past year, um, hiring um, eight new planners that fan out across these geographies and um, imagining and inviting the public to come in and engage deeply. And when we in launched this effort, um, there were, we had uh, community meetings of four and 500, and this was all pre uh, COVID. And then as COVID came in, we reinvented a digital way of creating that round table conversation where monthly we hold uh, these Zoom round ta table meetings. But the question was always, again, reflecting the value of that particular community by asking them, you know, what are the buildings that you love? Just tell us um, what buildings you cherish. And inevitably, buildings like the ones you see here were mentioned. Uh, and we decided to build the redevelopment strategy around that. And by, for the first time, putting out a call for developer proposals to work on those sites, uh, working on these visions with the community before the solicitation happened. Uh, and so I briefly will show you um, three of those RFPs because it's a very different way of working. Um, we uh, were fortunate to partner with some of the best architectural firms uh, in Chicago. Um, SOM, Perkins and Will, um, Studio Gang, and many, many others, and play out a scenario, in this case of these commercial corridors, of what, would, what it would be like if we took advantage of every publicly owned opportunity along those corridors uh, and tapped into the economic underpinning that addressed this leakage of millions of dollars outside of these communities because they couldn't, they didn't have a place where they could spend those resources in their community. And then working through kind of architectural visualization, imagining what it would be like to do a grocery with a, a, a local farmer's market. Now this is work uh, that we would engage residents in before we pull, uh, put out a call for proposals. Uh, and constantly trying to help them understand the potential uh, uh, for these streets to be animated again with transparency. With community uses, with retail, with mix of housing above. And so we played out these scenarios and then uh, listening to what they said of this amazing bank building, how we could show how that particular site might be an opportunity for reinvestment. So this historic bank, the city assembles the parcels next to it. We go through a process of imagining what is possible on the site um, with housing and then put together the financial um, incentive 
to make this development happen. The same thing on with Auburn Gresham, uh, this very walkable corridor in another part of Chicago, finding again um, how we could build around the transit component and how we could value uh, the buildings that were already there. And so you have um, this typical type of financial um, um, formula for uh, development of about a $16 million project of which using the public resources, you could catalyze the private investment. And so the city um, puts in 2.1 million uh, and a variety of other sources to turn this building into an amazing healthy hub with a vegan soul restaurant on the ground floor, a pharmacy, and then um, public health uh, clinics above. Uh, but for us, the, the important part was showing people the kind of public life um, that could happen, that could spring out. We would take this private investment owned lo locally by a CDC, and we would market the site directly across the street and try to convey um, the kind of um, innovation that we were looking for uh, from design, the kind of density and, um, and street life that we were attempting to, cre to create. And then uh, the third one in Inglewood, where um, a project which was uh, trying to use, use um, parcels that were left over from a redevelopment of a Whole Foods uh, um, that you see and giving a vision of mixed use and building around, again, an existing asset, uh, an abandoned fire station, and specifically trying to create the public realm, a kind of commons uh, that would be Inglewood, the square of Inglewood, at the same time uh, on the street, um, creating uh, that mixed use kind of vibrancy that, that has a pedestrian uh, orientation. Uh, and so we are committed to releasing these RFPs uh, every three months in uh, another community to the point where we can create a kind of partnership uh, that has not happened before where um, black and brown developers are developing the properties in partnership with resident and um, civic organizations and um, with an ownership stake in the development. The other part of that effort is um, trying to address uh, the multitude of vacant, um, vacant storefronts on many of these corridors. And this is where that relationship between downtown and neighborhoods becomes so explicit. On one end, you have the uh, Tribune Tower, which will be the second tallest tower uh, in Chicago. Uh, they pay into a financial um, fund as a bonus for the density that will then go to uh, reanimate um, storefronts and buildings in neighborhoods. And so you, we're talking about reimagining um, local neighborhood entrepreneurship by the dozens and dozens that will fill in these corridors and create the kind of vibrancy that those corridors once had. And we're in our second round, the first round uh, produced um, uh, 32 finalists. But what was fascinating about it is these are the types of buildings, these everyday buildings in neighborhoods that are now being um, renovated um, and done with a collection of designers um, where we pre-qualified um, Chicago-based firms that were willing to form partnerships around design excellence to um, work with these communities and achieve the level of excellence uh, that these neighborhoods uh, richly deserve. And so um, I um, thought it was important to show uh, how uh, equity and this notion of creating a kind of place specific community driven strategy that places design innovation uh, at its core. And I fundamentally believe uh, that if we seize these opportunities 
um, we can get to a place of equity. We can get to a place uh, of justice. Um, and so thank you for your, your attention. Uh, and um, I look forward if we have any time uh, for questions. Hey, hey Maurice, uh, congratulations. Um, uh, since you've been to RPI before, I just want to remind you that uh, inside MPAC, uh, our Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, the, the room pre-pandemic would have been filled. <laughs> it would have been a standing ovation and you would have uh, understood in real time the genuine appreciation of the student body and the faculty. So I'm... I'm I'm stating that as a narrative, uh, but I want, I want that to communicate that to you because um, it was like a masterclass uh, in um, teaching all of us uh, how all these uh, affiliated disciplines come together as a synergistic proposition mm -hmm. and under the right circumstances and and you define many of them, if it's, if it's truly uh, working as a kind of catalytic machine, uh, it has the capacity to do something substantial. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll, I'll first preface by saying that um, I hope the students are in the process of writing down a, a series of questions because we're going to open it up uh, to the general audience, and that includes faculty and, and alumni. But I thought I would uh, kind of kick it off uh, with, with a series of questions, Maurice. Um, it seems to me one of the most uh, important and poignant uh, takeaways from the presentation uh, is that uh, kind of, how should I say it, counter to an antiquated model of architectural education and, and the preparatory foundation for, for uh, a practicing architect, which places mm -hmm. a disproportionate amount of emphasis on kind of novelty and design. You pointed out throughout the presentation how important it was to address entrepreneurship mm. as a creative and, uh, um, essential model uh, to be able to kind of move abstract and even pragmatic ideas uh, into action. And so it's a, it's a two-part question. The first one uh, brings us back to the city of Detroit and, and you um, kind of presented a rather uh, a dire and troubling context and it seemed to me that you and your colleagues collectively had to kind of will uh, a sense of hope mm -hmm. uh, and um, a kind of vision of a regenerative uh, city that obviously was not there. I mean, a massive, massive set of hurdles that you had to overcome. In, in, in the context of this uh, uh, discussion about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and uh, and devising a series of rather uh, flexible and agile um, economic models. C can you speak a little bit more how you were able, you and the mayor, again, and your collaborative team were able to generate uh, the kind of enthusiasm and buy-in uh, from public and and private uh, mm -hmm. institutions, organizations, and we're talking about billions of dollars that, that enabled you to, to move forward uh, that vision. Yeah. No, I think, uh, I mean, I, I, I love the, that you picked up on that. Um, I, could have, uh, I could have given a lecture just on uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of people coming forward in response um, to um, our willingness to engage them in the creative process. I mean, I, I wish, I, you know, I was, you know, I never, um, it never ceased to amaze me 
how ordinary citizens responded to the creative impulse. I didn't have to dumb down the design. I actually confronted them with aspirational, um, challenging concepts. Like how do you turn the entire neighborhood into a nursery? Mm -hmm. uh, and knowing that you, you are touching in the, in, on the entrepreneur in everyone uh, to try to figure that out. Uh, and that design had a really critical role in helping them figure that out. Because so, so I found that people are inherently um, resilient. Uh, they love their neighborhoods, but so seldomly do we come to the table willing uh, to engage them um, in what we have to offer and understand that there's a kind of teachable moment. You're going to teach them something and they're going to teach you something. Uh, and just an acknowledgement of their inherent creativity. Um, I found un, uh, brought a, an enormous number of people to the forefront, uh, young, um, young risk takers who were willing um, to invest because they could purchase a property. And if you brought the team, the architects, the landscape architects, the urban designers to them, they were just kind of amazed by the disciplines, I would say superpowers, right. uh, that, with no exposure that you could actually conjure up an image of what they were describing. And so there is an inherent respect um, that you learn. I think some of it comes from my um, years in politics where you know everyone comes to you, uh, they, they share, their aspirations, their dreams, uh, and you become the, the holder of those. Uh, now, that's what a, a politician often is asked to do. Imagine if that is a creative person, if it's a designer being asked to hold the aspirations of a community and to honor them and to amplify them. And so I actually found that my, um, my disposition, my willingness, um, to engage people who were artists, people who were, you know, were gardeners, uh, people who had a creative impulse, and to latch onto that and show them what a person who can make things visible to them can offer. Uh, and so, um, you know, I put some pretty challenging designers uh, before um, these very ordinary um, residents of a community that had not been honored in that way before. Uh, and I'm finding that same aspect to be true uh, in Chicago, in an area of the city that has been so disinvested that we would take the time to, to uh, engage them in a, a conversation about what's possible, um, unleashes a level of creativity that I think is inherent uh, in communities and that's why it's so wonderful to be there um, as opposed to be working exclusively, you know, on downtown skyscrapers. Uh, if there's, something, um, there's something about neighborhood development uh, that is incremental, uh, that is at the scale in which people can understand it, uh, that I think allows um, more opportunity uh, that designers uh, often um, haven't fully uh, take advantage of. So, so Maurice, let me um, uh, highlight the fact that, that, that the community engagement that you're talking about, which appears to have been a novel and, and critical aspect uh, of, your, of your, how should I say, your process mm -hmm. and your success in terms of being able to actualize your vision. It, it, it highlights the fact that you, you have a top-down and a bottom-up approach that are, that are working uh, simultaneously. And when I talk about the top-down approach, certainly uh, one of the, the um, it, uh, how should I say it, examples of that was you, you sketching on the wall, uh, as you said, <laughs> right. people from one day to the next is a kind of provocation that would ultimately be translated over time. But before we move on, or, or I respond to the bottom-up approach, which in itself is uh, wonderfully 
generous and ethical and empowering. I, I want to, you didn't mention it, but the Ford Foundation, if my, mm -hmm. my understanding is, is that uh, a, a significant amount of capital uh, was, was necessary as an investment from a private foundation like the Ford Foundation in order uh, once again to, to be able to move forward with your implementation plans. Can you sure. talk about that other side for a moment and give us some insight? Sure. Well, I mean, again, I, I, uh, though um, the resources to bring in these um, world-renowned designers uh, didn't come, the, the foundation, the one that I think you're thinking of is the Kresge Foundation, which is headquartered in Detroit uh, and has been behind all things good uh, in Detroit. Uh, uh, Rip Rapson is a, a genius and he's, mar he's marshaled um, millions if, uh, of dollars around Detroit, but that was happening before I got there. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was it wasn't uh, it was how those resources were being used a lot of the resources were about trying to create the catalyst for a resurgent downtown what was new about what we did was we changed the environment we said innovation is going to happen in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. and we are we're going to use the same creative um, tools that we use in downtown development but we're going to take that into the ordinary places where people live and adjust its scale and our ambition. So not our ambition, but we were going to put, um, try to ignite people's aspirations um, and use that public private philanthropic partnership. So those, um, those uh, plans were paid for through, um, community development block grant dollars, which all communities get uh, relative to their, um, their financial, their social economic status. But we were using those, those, those partnerships of those quarter square miles to create design commissions. Um, and so we would be working to come up with these strategies. I would say, we, you know, these were nice commissions, uh, you know, between 300 and $500,000 to create a comprehensive framework. But so many of those designers had said, no one has ever asked us to solve the problem you're asking us to solve. Right. Normally those kind of resources are reserved for like downtown development. So that was fairly new. Those were public dollars. But in, in Chicago, it's been fascinating. When I said we want to attract private development uh, in these neighborhoods and we wanted to be of the highest order, well, you know, to respond to a request for developer proposals costs a lot of money. And so working in partnership with uh, the Chicago Community Trust, um, they stood up a pre-development fund, put several millions of dollars in it and made it available to emerging developers who might want to respond to one of these RFPs. And so it's constantly that notion that philanthropy has an amazing power to level the playing field. Right. The public has the opportunity to create, you know, the, the catalytic uh, investment opportunity, right? The site that, that you can own, the, the, the policies that you can use to make that possible. And then the private sector, has to come to the table with what they know how to do best and to do it in a way which honors the communities in which they are developing. And so these entities all exist. Very often they're not in this coordinated, um, uh, comprehensive approach. And this is where being both a, a, an architect who has had to work through public process, uh, someone in the public sector who understands that designers and the community needs an advocate in City Hall and the kind of generosity of the philanthropic world, if you can get those elements working in coordination, I think you can achieve, you can achieve equity. Uh, that would be my take. Right. And, and I, I kind of started off with this line of questioning, uh, Maurice, because uh, a few years ago, 
uh, we launched an entrepreneurship and architecture course in the School of Architecture, not, not as an elective, but as a required course, uh, mm -hmm. precisely in, in recognition uh, that business models uh, should be interpreted as creative entities no different than uh, material or representational systems. <clears throat> and that there's enough proof, certainly in the last uh, couple of decades, that uh, uh, in the context of dealing with uh, the complexity of, of the marketplace, that if if uh, our graduates, and not just at, at Rensselaer, but around the world, mm -hmm. were far more savvy in the area of business, uh, the likelihood of, of them being able to figure out how to move their ideas into actions uh, yeah. uh, uh, would be um, something kind of profoundly tangible. Do, yeah. I'm curious if you want to kind of say anything about the education of the architect in relation to entrepreneurship. Sure. Well, I, 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 I wish uh, I wish I had fundamentally understood um, that what I was being taught in school was um, how to be an innovator. Uh, and my medium was architecture. Um, but I don't know if uh, if designers think of themselves as going to architecture school to become entrepreneurs. But ultimately, uh, that is what is going on. And I, I know so many um, fearless designers who have taken on the development component at the scale in which they can do it. And, I'm, and I've seen amazing results. Um, so so we, we often talk about the, the way of integrating all of these incredible components that make up uh, an artifact to delivery of an artifact, but it's often not explained that what you're doing is you're understanding systems, systems of delivery. All of those projects, like how to turn a neighborhood with you know 40 acres into a working nursery, that's an architectural problem. How to figure that out, how to take um, vacant parcels along a co corridor and infuse um, a, 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 to reinvent the request for proposal process that will engender partnerships that are inclusive and diverse. I had to figure that out. I mean, the pre-development, I had to go to a foundation uh, mm -hmm. to do that in order to get minority developers to respond. I, we, they, we had to help them create a network of private commercial real estate developers who, who are of color. So I just feel um, strongly that um, architecture, the study of architecture is the study of entrepreneurship. Uh, and you probably would be well served um, if you don't get to take a business class while you're in school, that you take one after, um, right. or that you put yourself in the place where your talents can be discovered, which is generally uh, in communities. We are coming out of uh, COVID and it's been uh, a dramatic, uh, jarring experience of how to create and build a civic realm that allows people uh, to dine outdoors. Well, a group of architects in Chicago called Architects Reimagining Chicago came forward in the spirit of pro bono and said, how can we help create dynamic places where people can dine outdoors? Uh, and we, we are now celebrating the third amazing transformation of the public realm uh, in areas that historically um, had very little public realm. Uh, once again, uh, you know, it was helpful to be, have a partner in City Hall that could help them cut through the bureaucracy and just allow them to make the connections to community organizations so that they could do um, what they do best. And that is to kind of create form and place. Um, so I just, you know, they're doing it pro bono. Some of the architects have said it's the most satisfying work uh -huh. that they have done and they're doing it for free but they're having an impact in the lives 
of people. So I just feel that, you know, um, any firm, uh, and I, I think we all know that if you go work for a firm, um, there's, there is a desire, particularly with this generation, to use their skills in different ways. And a lot of firms are making the space for those young designers to go out and do something that has social relevancy. Uh, and that is an opportunity for designers to learn to be entrepreneurs, to work within communities that are overrun with opportunities and very seldomly have access uh, to the, the, the tools uh, that we exercise every day. Um, so I found some of the greatest opportunities right there uh, in the neighborhoods in which I've lived. And I would just encourage designers to continue to think about that as a platform for creative expression. Right, thank you Maurice for that. Um, really, I mean, certainly uh, this, the lecture could have gone on much longer and a year or two from now when you've been in Chicago much longer, uh, I imagine um, your larger uh, vision of the kinds of transformations that you think are important for Chicago there'll be more kind of uh, substantial evidence of that. But on the surface, it, it seems to me that there's a, a, a kind of wonderful juxtaposition and contrast that, that due to a variety of, of reasons, uh, Detroit provided you uh, with, to, to a certain extent, a kind of empty camp uh, canvas, mm -hmm. that the, the lack of, of density and, and the, the, the kind of distributed porosity, uh, which was the kind of major attribute of the city, enabled you to kind of rethink it. And although you didn't use the term Venice, I thought of Venice and, and how the discrete islands uh, were uh, connected by the, the various bridges and that mm -hmm. you, you were, you're simultaneously thinking about these um, kind of disparate entities and how they're part of a larger holistic project. And so, and you spoke about this a lot tonight, but it's so kind of beautiful to think of, of, as, of design as an anti anticipatory proposition mm -hmm. that, that rather than I'm just, I'm exaggerating the point that, that uh, designed objects and design buildings might often be misinterpreted as inert, stable, autonomous uh, elements. Uh, in contrast, you, you've, you've always envisioned uh, the city as, as a dynamic living system that is undergoing continuous change. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, in light of that, are there certain challenges? Because on some, on, on some level, you're having to imagine what the city will be like 10, 20, 30 years from now. Sure. I'm sure that in the time of, uh, uh, of the automobile era, no one could have imagined uh, Detroit as you found it. In other mm -hmm. words, cities can, oh. can, can rise and fall like tides. Uh, can, can you speak about maybe some of the the, the areas of ambivalence uh, and angst sure. that, that uh, was part of your process. Sure. You know, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty challenging because uh, the design disciplines come to the table with enormous baggage, enormous baggage. Uh, 50 years of race-based policies that have shaped uh, the landscape that we inherit today. Um, you know, from urban renewal in the 60s to the highway construction that literally mowed through uh, low income and communities of color. Um, you know, the, 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 re, uh, the tearing down of public housing with uh, the promise of rebuilding it, but we really didn't rebuild it. The depopulating of areas that then leads to the closing of schools. I mean, it's just uh, um, neighborhoods have been ravished by the disciplines of planning and design. And so you don't get to park that at the door. 
when you come to a community, we end up having to um, acknowledge um, the, the hurt that has been done in the name of progress. Um, and so one of the biggest challenges, um, you know, we have to win people's trust back. They are inherently suspicious and it is for good reason. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I, no one gives their trust willingly after living in neighborhoods that have been disinvested, uh, that are falling in de decay. And so that is part of what is humbling about um, doing this work. Uh, I'm I talk to people who have been hurt by design. And now I am coming in saying, well, design, if you shape it, uh, can be a catalyst um, for renewal of your community. And uh, it takes, one reason why there's so many darn meetings is because it takes time, you know, and time uh, equals trust. The more time you have, the more trust people will give you uh, with some of these ideas that might seem um, purely aspirational. Uh, and then I think, um, so that's a reality. I mean, Chicago is one of the most segregated cities in America. Uh, and I have been asked by this mayor to work on those areas uh, that are largely black and brown, uh, that have been largely disinvested, but have largely and intentionally been excluded um, from the prosperity of this city. And that's where she wanted me to start. Uh, and to focus on it like a laser and to bring all of my creative being um, to honor those people who stayed. Uh, and so there is a, a similarity in that regard uh, between um, my experience, uh, quite frankly, even in New Orleans, as people were trying to come back and rebuild that city uh, with cre creativity, but they wanted not to hand it over to designers, they wanted a partnership with designers. And that takes a reassessment of, you know, who is the, uh, the, the who, who is the entity that brings the ideas? Uh, and, you know, um, I contend that communities who know their communities deeply, if given the proper tools, can shape those tools to their will and mm -hmm. create something extraordinary and create opportunities that architects have rarely seen, or they only associate it with those who have enormous wealth to be able to realize those visions. Um, one of the beauties of working in the public sector um, is we have access to resources, um, whether it's through TIF, TIF uh, tax increment financing, or whether it's through um, you know, bonds. Um, you, from the public, you can marshal millions and millions of dollars um, to help fund these transformational projects. But it takes, um, it takes a degree of humility and empathy and respect for those who you're working with in order to marshal those resources in a way uh, that lifts them, uh, lifts them up. So um, I've always felt that there's something powerful about uh, the public interest um, and, and the accountability that I feel um, to an entire city, uh, neighborhoods, to use those resources in the most strategic, in the most impactful way, um, but to honor them, honor the value that those communities have and their self-worth to only bring the very best and innovative uh, thought uh, to the table. Maurice, thanks for that eloquent answer. Um, we're going to open it up uh, for questions. And the first one is from uh, Angie Applewhite. And she writes, first and foremost, uh, thank you so much for all that you've done and continue to do for so many communities and sharing these moving projects with us. My question is, as an urban planning leader in Detroit and Chicago, creating generative uh, spaces for locals did you have to factor into your planning how to prevent later gentrification in response to these projects in the communities? And if so, how did you go about implementing that safeguard? 
Um, well, Angie, that's a great question. Uh, and it is at the forefront of my thinking always, um, because uh, when you make something attractive for the people who live there, whether it be a greenway or a reimagined streetscape or a park, you also make something that's attractive to others who might also want to be a part of that. And the question is always, how do you embed those who are there in everything so that they feel a sense of ownership? So, um, so one thing is like in the creation of the Ella Fitzgerald Park, uh, there are literally the handprints of residents in that park. They, they made that park and they feel a sense of ownership because they physically were a part of its making. Um, in other instances, when we're doing significant capital improvements, uh, often we look widely at the policy um, frameworks that are needed to um, uh, push back on the displacing impacts of that kind of investment. So for example, we would go into a neighborhood and we would do a scan of all of the naturally occurring affordable housing uh, and find a way to refinance that housing for another generation so that people knew that they could stay. Or um, very often it has to do with a big infrastructure improvement like a park or a greenway. Uh, you can use the tools of planning to create overlay districts um, that prevent like bad things from happening. So if you are creating a, a greenway and the, the, uh, the reality is that a lot of houses, a lot of people would like to live near that greenway. Um, so they might tear down a small house and build a bigger house. Well, through the public policy instruments, you can, you can um, stop that from happening. So I often feel that while um, you do the physical improvements, the transformations, but you have to have an eye towards the policy tools that will live far, far longer uh, to offset those um, other uh, unintended consequences, keeping an eye towards all of that simultaneously. And so I, in planning in Chicago, I have, uh, I, I manage the the financial incentives that are given for development. I manage the zoning. Uh, I manage the historic preservation and I manage the urban design and planning. So under one uh, umbrella, I, I have the ability to keep all of these elements in, uh, in some type of relationship to each other. And hopefully that will um, assist in the kind of gentrifying impacts of these type of investments. Uh, thanks, Maurice. Here's another question from Christiana Bennett, a faculty member in the School of Architecture. Uh, Mr. Cox, thank you for an amazing lecture. The first question is, <clears throat> what are one or many of the aspects of cities that you feel in your experience are most taken for granted? Taken for granted by designers, taken for granted by non-designers, perhaps it's the social, people, infrastructure, landscapes, and ecologies, building mass, technological or construction-derived innovation, et cetera. Hmm. So, um, I mean, one of the things I, I, I must admit, um, you know, cities are amazing convergence of, of innovators, of people who are inherently social, who are inherently attracted to culture uh, and to other people. And I, I think we all thought that that's, that will always be the case. We will always be able to gather. We'll always be able to go to museums and theater and dine. And then along came a pandemic and it just ruptured our ability to congregate, uh, to be with each other. Uh, and I think we, we kind of took it for granted that public space would always be there for us, uh, that public transit would always be safe for us. Um, and this past year has been a jolt to that system uh, that talked about, you know, the aggregation of people as being um, 
uh, a, just a foregone conclusion. And we are now trying to understand what it means to have a, um, a disparate, a system that um, has smaller nodes. Um, I'm in my office today, but I, I, I come to my office once a week just to remind me that there's a downtown. Uh, I normally can do all of these things uh, from my home. Uh, and all of a sudden, the, that scale of living becomes incredibly important. The fact that I can walk to a grocery store, the fact that I can get on my bike uh, to get my exercise, um, the fact that you know I should be able to um, meet all of my daily needs uh, in my neighborhood. I, I think that um, I think it's a new form. It's almost like the urban village is being reinvented uh, before our very eyes. And instead of um, resisting it, I think you know a lot of the diagrams that I showed you, whether they were Detroit and this archipelago of higher density areas or uh, in Chicago, these 10 areas around transit effectively are creating urban villages. Um, and I think the pandemic has only made that model more lucid uh, and intentional uh, in my mind. Um, and so I can now imagine a life that's not dependent on downtown. Uh, I just could not imagine it uh, even a year ago, but that model is becoming clearer in my head. Oh, thanks, Maurice. Uh, another uh, question from Christiana. Um, how can we as designers and future urbanists tackle the sometimes overpowering voices and mm. demands of professional engineers and developers? In mm. other words, how do we stay competitive, in quotes, in the room? Right. And, and where decisions are being made. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a fascinating question. And, you know, I've always been intrigued by how do we give voice uh, to um, creative individuals who um, are often uh, not attracted uh, to those places uh, where um, our values aren't always shared. Uh, and so I have largely led a career of... Uh, public interests, uh, working for public institutions. Um, and I have often been one of the few people in the room coming from a design background. And so um, I would just encourage um, designers to be in those unlikely places so that we can constantly contribute uh, our point of view. Uh, you know, we'll always be outnumbered by the lawyers uh, and the developers, uh, but make no mistake about it, uh, when you get into a position where you can change the equation, um, you can uh, essentially invite uh, others into the room. So for example, uh, for each one of the uh, neighborhoods that we are um, um, trying to reimagine in Chicago on the west side and the south side, uh, we created a program uh, a residency for artists. So for each one of those neighborhoods, there is an artist who is um, asked to play a curatorial role on the design team um, so that they have a seat at every table, at every decision that's being made about the built environment. Uh, and I'm doing that together with my partners at the um, Department of Cultural um, uh, cultural arts here, D case. Um, but just think about that. In every team, uh, as we talk about the built in natural environment, there is a local artist who is there uh, not to paint murals, but to add the voice of a creative discipline to every conversation, whether it be about the built environment or the natural environment. And so uh, constantly, uh, what I try to do is honor these dissonant voices um, that can push back and represent different values than the values of disciplines that are always there, the engineers, the developers. And you begin to create a kind of creative friction mm -hmm. uh, that is so vital to creating anything new and innovative. 
so that would be how I would uh, respond. Um, you get in and you make a place for another di allied discipline. I'm an architect, but I hired probably more landscape architects than we did architects in Detroit because I understood that they had uh, uh, something different and new to bring to the table. Um, and then of course, um, here in Chicago, an extraordinary production of artists, you know, people like the Astor Gates, uh, uh, Amanda Williams, there are artists in Chicago who are known to be shapers of place. Uh, and so I said, what if we had one uh, in residency for each of these efforts? Um, and Maurice, you know, it's interesting because I'm, I'm probably the only one uh, in the room tonight uh, that could uh, point to the fact that uh, the genesis of your deep appreciation for a kind of interdisciplinary conversation based, a kind, uh, based upon a kind of uh, provocation chance meeting uh, can be traced back to our education uh, where uh, John Hadick uh, brought in a poet and a sound artist. <laughs> and, and at the time, uh, that was uh, considered uh, completely radical and almost absurd because it didn't have an apparent direct correlation to the education of an architect. But on the contrary, and we both know this uh, very, very well, it kind of unleashed uh, the interiority of one's imagination. It, mm -hmm. it, it placed you, as you mentioned, in unfamiliar territory, and it kind of forced you to reassess uh, certain conventions uh, about the practice and about the discipline. And I can see that uh, the kind of brilliance of, of uh, redeploying that mm. as a kind of organizational model um, in recognition that maybe something more advanced, something unexpected, something uh, quite marvelous uh, might emerge at the end of that collaboration. Mm -hmm. I, I, kudos to you. Well, I, I, I love you bringing that back to, again, some of those core values um, that we uh, got in our education. Um, I, 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 I totally forgot uh, <laughs> of the poets. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 that appreciation for other disciplines and what they have to offer uh, I, I really feel that immensely. Uh, if you, you know, if you have a landscape, um, you know, you should probably acknowledge that the landscape um, architect looks at that vacant site is not so vacant, but is full. Whereas mm -hmm. if you brought in an architect, they say, well, the answer is a building on that vacant lot. Well, we would have never come up with the uh, the strategy of hundreds of flowering meadows uh, in Fitzgerald, if we had given that assignment to an architect, right. it was a landscape architect who brought that, or uh, an artist that sees the, the ground uh, as a canvas or buildings as a place to infuse them with, with art. And I have a, a number of wonderful artist architect collaborations um, in Detroit uh, where the archi architect and artists are making the building together and you can see the influence of the artist on the built form. Um, so, you know, planning, urban designers, there, I, there were more architects working in the planning department than there were city planners. There were more landscape architects. And in here in, uh, in Chicago, I'm doing the same thing, hiring people who have cross-disciplinary expertise, uh, both in planning, but in urban design, in architecture, but also landscape architecture. And it makes for an amazingly rich conversation and unexpected results. You know, I, I, I do want to move back to the questions uh, from the audience, but I, I, I want to uh, also uh, highlight the fact that you and I spent a, a good portion of uh, our early years growing up in the city, one of the most uh, dense mm. urban environments uh, in the United States. And in the middle of the city, uh, kind of ironically, is, is a kind of infinite expanse, Central mm. Park, right? Uh, yeah. The, the kind of uh, 
performative and conceptual and visceral brilliance uh, built into the uh, deep material and, and organizational genesis of that park is one of the greatest contributions and innovations to, to New York City. And, and I, and I uh, point to that as, as, as reference uh, in relation to an earlier comment you made when you were talking about Detroit and you were on the waterfront and you show these beautiful uh, renderings uh, of the proposed kind of pastoral sublime landscapes mm -hmm. that would emerge, manifest uh, and be offered back to the city as a kind of a collective gift. And you use the term, a kind of surreal landscape. Mm -hmm. it, it was one of the few moments where you, you uh, took language and inflected in such a way that, that we can talk about pragmatic, substantial, concrete uh, implementation strategies, but we also wanna make room for the unexpected mm -hmm. and, and the way in which cities can, can kind of explode and serve as catalysts for our imagination. And, and I, my sense is this was something that was a priority for you throughout the process uh, in, in recognition that the presence of the absence, and I'm talking about landscape, Mm -hmm. Living between something that is there and, and, and something that offers as a kind of a bracket, a window, a stage, uh, a, a place of, of, how should I say, kind of a spectrum of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there, um, I, I, this issue of uh, delight in, in spectacle and uh, beauty uh, which were terms that as planning director, I would use, yeah. uh, would, would catch people off guard. I mean, sometimes I would have to say, you know, um, there has to be a wow factor. Uh, you have to notice this as you're walking in the space. It has to stop you in your tracks. It has to be visible, present. Uh, and, um, and, you know, the, a, lot of, a lot of bureaucrats are getting that. You know, if we're going to invest millions of dollars, it should fill people with wonder. Right. It really, it really should. And, um, you know, it's not about the bare minimum. It's not about maintenance. It's about something that is genuinely of delight. Uh, and I found those landscapes um, unexpected, um, um, uh, jarring in their uh, ability to take you to another place. Uh, and how important that is uh, in the kind of daily comings and goings uh, in uh, one's neighborhood. So I, I, I'm constantly trying to make the city um, visible. And I would agree, I mean, walking from the grid of Manhattan into, into, um, into Central Park uh, as a high school student, because mm -hmm. um, I was, um, it was a wonderland. It was surreal. Yeah. I'm constantly trying to see how do you create those moments that take people away uh, from the mundane and the everyday. And that's largely why I focus so much on the public realm, you know, because it belongs to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, it, we leg legitimately, it is public. And uh, you don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be educated to appreciate that public space. Uh, and that's a, where a lot of the focus, the buildings are really important, but they're there really to kind of create and shape um, that public experience. Uh, and so I may, um, we, you know, it's, it's challenging to get mm -hmm. architecture uh, that draws your attention, um, that makes you take note uh, because it's so complex the financing, the delivery, the review process. Um, and so I'm constantly trying to find ways to make those buildings um, noteworthy. Uh, and I can assure you, uh, I talk about design excellence every day. Uh, and people know um, that I wanna honor these communities 
with things that dignify them uh, and are special. Uh, and it's, it's um, yeah, it's a challenge, uh, but, uh, but I keep pressing the hey, point. Thanks. thanks, Maurice, for those words of wisdom. So this next question is from, uh, you've got time for us, right? I do, if, if you know, it stays um, that people are still here. <laughs> yeah, how, how would you compare the kinds of oppressive uh, infrastructures described in Eve Ewing's Ghosts in the Schoolyard, Racism and the School Closings on Chicago's South Side to the urban patterns and challenges in Detroit? What yeah. impact do urban edges have on both the perpetuation and the revitalization of inequality disconnect, decay, and thank you so much for your insights. Well, um, you know, this is a fascinating question uh, that I thought I was not going to have to address when I came to Chicago. Right. Uh, you have to understand in Detroit, because of the, the um, loss of uh, 1.2 million people over the course of 50 years, uh, those people um, left their homes, they left their churches, places of worship, uh, they left their schools standing. Those buildings are still there. And so when I left um, Detroit, we had just finished uh, a study of 70, 70 school, vacant schools uh, that had to, we had to invent a way to repurpose them. We had to invent a way to hold on to them, right? Because it was going to be a long time before those schools found their repurpose. And we had to actually invent a new set of words to describe how you invest incrementally in an asset that may be too large, that may not find its repurpose for years, uh, called tactical preservation, where, you know, you... Um, allow uh, spaces and buildings to be occupied in increments while the majority of them are, are um, mothballed. Um, it, but it was 70 schools. So I get to Chicago and I said, well, I'll never have to deal with that scale of vacancy again. And I inherit uh, a incredible policy from a previous administration that closed 50 schools, 50 schools in Chicago wow. were closed uh, and they are closed to this day. And the challenge of planning is to find a way uh, to find, help them find their reuse. And so the planning department is now responsible for putting out requests for proposals for innovative reuses of those schools. But you have to do it in a way that honors the role that those schools played in the lives of those communities. You can't just sell them to the highest bidder. Um, and so we are in the process of trying to correct uh, this uh, extraordinary, um, uh, really inequity that, that occurred on the South side and the West side. Uh, and it's, it's hard, you know, it's uh, the broken window syndrome, when you take a multi-acre site, when you take some majestic iconic building and you shutter it, uh, it has an impact in the geography around, around it. But it also, you know, you can put them back into context. Um, and, uh, but it is a, it's a slow process and it's a process of trying to get communities to let go of the fact that those schools will, may never be schools again, but they may be cultural centers. They may be uh, centers for the art. They may be uh, housing. Uh, they may be uh, incubators. They can and will uh, find their repurpose, but it has to be done as an incredibly deliberative process. So I, um, the, the ghosts uh, in the schoolyard, um, I'm gonna, that's a book uh, that I'm going to um, uh, order so that I can genuinely understand what residents are saying uh, about the meaning uh, of that chapter, which was a devastating chapter uh, in uh, Chicago urban history. And this is what I mean by how challenging it is 
to win uh, a community's trust when they've seen these urban policies act um, to their detriment. But I'm inherently an optimist and I'm willing uh, to have that conversation with communities. Uh, thanks, Maurice. Here, here's a, a question from uh, Michael Oatman, uh, another uh, distinguished professor in the School of Architecture. Um, inspiring presentation, Mr. Cox. I know our, uh, that our friend and your former colleague, R. Stephen Lewis, <laughs> want me to say hello. Uh, wondering if either of these projects were realized with interns or if your draw regularly uh, from regional or national NOMIS groups. Uh, also wondering if you could recap, uh, in quotes, the Idea City panel with you and uh, Theaster Gates. Could you speak a little about your dialogue? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the amazing things about the experience of Detroit is that I was able to attract top flight talent uh, from around the country uh, to come and be a part of reimagining that city. And Stephen Lewis was uh, one, uh, really um, an amazing uh, African-American architect um, who um, helped me um, seize the moment, seize the opportunity of Detroit. Um, I, you know, for many years I taught uh, at a number of uh, wonderful schools. So I have an inherent um, belief um, in helping young professionals uh, find their calling. And so we would uh, bring in interns um, from around the country uh, who were inspired by the work we were doing. Uh, and at you know, summer internships, uh, we would have uh, 15 interns uh, every summer. Uh, in the planning department. And it was what was amazing is many of those were uh, architects, young people studying to be architects. And they came from other disciplines as well, but they had never um, interned uh, at a planning department. And so I felt it was really important that these summer internships were not just um, opportunities to explore, you know, different scales of design practice, but um, an opportunity to um, understand the allied disciplines. And, you know, I, when I was, uh, when I was at Cooper Union, one of my internships uh, was with the um, IMP and I worked for um, uh, a urban planner that summer uh, who was uh, um, doing the whole uh, Jacob Javits Convention Center and the entire neighborhood um, around it. And, you know, I never really, you know, I, I, I don't often connect having had that exposure while I was in school of one of the allied disciplines um, allowed me to understand that there was something even greater than the building itself. And so I, I think um, um, I would encourage uh, students as they try to find where their calling is that they look broadly. Um, why not intern at a construction company? Why not intern at a developer's office? Why not intern at a, uh, a planning department uh, as a way to expand your, the possibilities uh, in your own um, professional formation? Um, uh, there's a second half of this question, but before I, I refer to it just out of curiosity, Maurice, we, we have a, a reasonably uh, large community of students that are gonna be uh, taking this coming spring off and are looking for internship <laughs> opportunities. Uh, does your planning department have any openings? Uh, it does, it, it does. always does. I, I, you know, the reality, unfortunately, I, you know, I don't believe in uh, unpaid internships. Right. So uh, often those internships um, would be sponsored by their um, home institution. Um, and maybe that's another, maybe that's another component of your, of your advisory board that would actually look to support young people who are interested in a, a career in public interest design. Uh, and so, um, I would be I would be fascinated to to uh, see um, if our 
if RPI could uh, sponsor one of those fellows, one of those interns, because uh, I really do think they should be compensated. So I put it back to you, Dean Douglas. <laughs> that was one of the most brilliant <laughs> pivots that I've ever seen in a public lecture, but I'll take it. Uh, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure they're going to reach out after this lecture under any circumstance. The second half of that question, uh, Maurice, was uh, wondering if you could recap the Idea City panel uh, with you and Thester Gates. Yeah, well, you know, I was trying to recall because I've done a number of uh, Idea City panels and uh, Thester Gates, we are constantly in dialogue uh, about um, the relationship between um, you know, the systems that make neighborhoods and the kind of creative impulse. So, um, you know, he, a theaster often, he, he deals with the systems and reinventing um, the financial models by which um, neighborhoods are, are created. And he, he embodies that practice here on the South side of, of Chicago in the bank building and many of the place-based projects that he has. Um, but, you know, he's, uh, he is, uh, you know, an artist who understands economics, uh, who uh, went to planning school. So he inherently is a hybrid. And yeah. we often talk about um, the idea of hybridity, the idea of mastering a number of allied disciplines in order to create, um, create change. And I, I think that that's a model um, that um, is extremely powerful. And whether you get it in school or you get it through experience that are you juxtaposed to your, your, your base education, um, I, I think the idea of being hybrid, to be a hyphenated practitioner uh, is an aspiration that I think we really should all um, uh, attempt. Yeah, that seems to be a message throughout the evening. Um, here's a question from uh, Alexandros. Um, for Detroit, where landscape was conceived off as a connective, performative, productive tissue that reinvents the city and drives its growth, what are some of the challenges posed by the weather, the climate, in ensuring continuity and economic activity that in any, any other normal city would be addressed with hard infrastructure and climate conditioning. I, I think that's from one of my great uh, faculty in New York City at uh, the Center for Architecture, Science and Ecology. But mm. uh, there's an interesting question for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know, uh, you know, Detroit is, uh, is a cold weather city, uh, pretty intense uh, winters. Um, but it is a city that in many ways, um, because of the vacant amount of vacant land, uh, is kind of a natural sponge. I mean, it is, things are constantly uh, growing. Uh, and I showed you some of those landscapes that are just left uh, to kind of return to the wild. Um, so I, you know, it, it wasn't, um, it, it felt like, we, the city was reinvented, reinventing itself from an ecological um, perspective. And you could tell from some of the images uh, that we were kind of returning the city to nature, but not, uh, it wasn't, um, there were, it was in the wild, uh, but there were moments of a great intentionality uh, and design and structure um, but I, I believe that the city is reinventing itself in a way that is self-sustaining. Um, you know, uh, you grow tree orchards, you, you plant, you know, meadows, um, you grow food, um, and a whole ecosystem emerges that is much more um, um, comfortable with living with nature uh, and allowing uh, some of the city to return to a, a, a wild state. Uh, but I think the areas um, that um, address, um, I don't know if it's the climactic conditions because uh, the summers are intense and they're regenerative, 
um, the, the winters are, are cold and have um, um, a kind of um, an expanse um, that is um, striking. I, 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 so I actually believe that Detroit um, could be um, one of the greenest cities uh, in America just by the natural state. And we, you know, people hibernate uh, in the winter. Um, they hibernate. Uh, and then there's a kind of return in the regeneration uh, that you have in a spring uh, and a summer. I mean, it's a fascinating, you know, question, um, but uh, I think that when you think about cities um, or you think about landscapes as performative, um, they can be beautiful uh, in the dead of winter um, and as well uh, in summer and in spring. Uh, and I just, just this past week, um, I was in Detroit at the, um, um, planting of Pete, o Pete Odoff's um, garden on Belle Isle. Uh, and it was, and thousands of plants were planted and it was, it was snowing. We were there and it was snowing. Uh, and I can't tell you how beautiful this new garden was um, in the, in, in a kind of a winter like uh, climate. So, um, we will see uh, as these landscapes continue to take form in Detroit and how they perform throughout uh, all of these various seasons. Hey, hey Maurice, I know that um, a, a slight uh, detour here, but it's, it's related. Um, I know that in a, in a, a private conversation offline, you've uh, uh, shared with me the fact that the planning department is collaborating uh, with uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a number of ways in which a collaboration could, could materialize uh, between uh, an academic institution and in your case, uh, a, a public sector. Um, one of them is around science, uh, uh, information technologies, uh, under, understanding uh, data flows, uh, um, Mm -hmm. Being able to perform a kind of diagnostic understanding of the environment uh, at, a, at, a, at a variety of levels, uh, both atmospheric and, and uh, 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 rising tides and so forth. Um, could, I, you tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, I assume you, you don't have a collaborative uh, partnership with a more kind of STEM-related uh, academic entity, and might this be something that you'd be interested in pursuing? And I'm speaking uh, more specifically with a case, the Center for uh, uh, Architecture, Science, and Ecology. Mm. Uh, it's in the forefront of this area, and I imagine I know for a fact some of the the faculty and administrative leaders are on the are on this uh, are online right now, listening to you. Interesting. Well, you know, uh, wherever I have um, practiced, uh, I have always had um, a really robust partnership with uh, institutions of higher learning uh, because of my own experience uh, and value I placed on research and exploration. So in Detroit, uh, you know, it was with the University of Michigan um, for um, an amazing architecture school where they looked at the rehousing of Detroit um, and, uh, you know, with the University of Pennsylvania uh, because of their historic preservation right. uh, department and entered into a, um, a multi-year um, partnership. Uh, and, uh, and even um, Cranbrook uh, and outside of Detroit um, where uh, some of the amazing design to build uh, talents where I brought them uh, into the city uh, to uh, help me reimagine uh, some of the kind of interior architecture spaces. Uh, and I've done the same here in, uh, in uh, Illinois at the University uh, IIT, uh, Mies van der Rohe's institution, uh, where um, they are doing the Chicago studio. Right. And so for every year, they have uh, half a dozen 
um, studios that are dedicated uh, to um, catalytic transformation on the South and West side. And so um, often because Chicago has an amazing draw, uh, we have uh, schools of architecture from around the country who um, use Chicago as a laboratory. Uh, and so I would be um, very interested um, in um, the research uh, that RPI uh, engages in to find the place where um, that research institution could um, add value. So uh, you have an open invitation um, to, um, to engage us in a conversation about what we're doing and allow your faculty and students to find their place um, uh, in this, I think, extraordinary experiment that we, we're in, uh, in the midst of. Well, thank you, Maurice. Uh, I assure you I will be following up uh, in, in the next 48 hours on that particular. Yeah, you, you wouldn't be a dean if you didn't uh, <laughs> advocate for your amazing. No, I, I actually think there's uh, some amazing synergy. And if you if you had the opportunity to meet the leadership, you'd be very impressed and you might be Good. able to find an opportunity. Um, yeah, that's fine. A, a few more questions. I know that you've been very generous with your time. This is from uh, Jordan Jackson. How did you come to doing design work for the government? Any advice for designers aspiring to work for the government and for the public interest? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for that question because, uh, um, you know, sometimes you have to, to see it, to, to, to be it. Um, and I, I have always been interested in trying uh, to reach folks who traditionally don't have access to this amazing um, resource that we're um, engaged in design. And so I've always tried to go to the place where I could find people um, who don't normally um, talk about design. Uh, and so that's generally the public. Uh, and uh, so I have um, been interested in getting into neighborhoods and talking to people about um, their community and that that leads to um, possibilities. Uh, now, um, you know, the, 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 the design discipline is structured around, you know, capital flows and, you know, the private, the private sector drives a lot of that. Um, but the public sector makes massive investments in the places where you can see design, uh, but you have to, um, you have to um, have a kind of public sector, public interest ex experience. Uh, and that's um, really why I've stayed so closely in the public space. Uh, we hire lots of designers, um, but there has to be someone on the inside that understands the power of that discipline and what they have to contribute. Uh, and then the other thing that I don't think I completely understood by design, but it has happened, is the greatest impact that I could possibly have is in the public. Um, you know, I was the mayor of a small university city. I never thought that I would um, be a planning director, because that's not my, that's not the discipline I studied in school, of a city of 680,000 uh, um, residents. Uh, and control over 24 square miles of land that's owned by the public. And I, I truly loved the, the experience of Detroit. I never thought that I would be having the impact on a city of you know, 2.7 million, the third, is, third largest city in America. Um, but it's only through the public uh, interest that I was able to have that impact. And so I hope that someone, um, you know, finds their way into a public practice uh, and discovers what I discovered, that you can have impacts when so many more people, if you're operating in the public sphere. Um, and so I, I have uh, most of the people who are in leadership positions in the planning department are actually not trained as planners. They're trained as architects. 
uh, and uh, I've hired uh, a lot of them uh, because I really believe that our 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 understanding of the the built environment and the delivery of something concrete is so so important. It's not a paper. It's not a policy document. It's a place. It's a building. It's a landscape. And architects are uniquely wired to deliver uh, those kinds of visions. So. Um, Sounds like the person who answered that question should probably do an internship <laughs> at a planning department. No, it's, it's, it's a, a, a beautiful and poignant, almost closing comments, Maurice. I, I, there's a number of things I wanna say in my closing remarks. And, and that is that, um, you know, you're, you're a generous human being and, and you've, you've lived your life in such a way that uh, it has uh, constantly evolved. And, and for those who don't uh, uh, know Maurice Cox as well as I do, he's designed his life. I'm not suggesting that uh, uh, there weren't uh, unexpected uh, circumstances and a certain uh, degree of luck. And he, he, he certainly is been at the top of the pyramid on that level, but he's worked awfully hard to uh, enable his curious mind uh, and his firm and genuine belief for uh, substantial change in terms of issues of social justice and equity and fairness and, and uh, the revitalization of, of urban life for everyone to be a kind of calling in his life. And, and I, I have spoken about you on, on numerous occasions, Maurice, both uh, publicly and privately, but most importantly to the student body uh, as an example uh, uh, of, a, of a kind of, how should you say it, a kind of an aspirational uh, agenda and, and uh, a kind of vitality, a creative vitality that has has been present with you for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And what's so beautiful is that um, in more recent years, and actually well before your appointment uh, as the Chief uh, Director of City Planning in Detroit, you, you've had the opportunity to transform communities and to empower uh, uh, a broad population of people and, and do it in, in a creative, uh, benevolent way that's sustainable too, right? I mean, you have moved on and New Orleans has been the recipient of your creative gifts. And the same thing with Detroit, you, you, you have uh, you, you've started a kind of revolution. And I mean that uh, as a design revolution that is able to perpetuate uh, well beyond and after the fact that you're now at Chicago. And I actually think some of the best work is yet to come. You, you have to stay healthy, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I know that your, your, your desire and your passion to do great work every day of your life uh, sustains you. And uh, on, on behalf of the school, and if I can be so bold on behalf of the discipline, both the academic uh, enterprise unit and uh, the profession, uh, we thank you for uh, an extraordinary uh, career, uh, an extraordinary life, and given the unique time that you mentioned, we didn't speak much about this, this perfect storm uh, between social justice, uh, the pandemic, the economy. Um, the next generation of architects certainly have a role model to look up to, and that's Maurice Cox. So thank Listen, you, my friend. Thank you, uh, you know, thank you, um, Evan, for, um, you know, creating the space um, uh, and exposing your students who I know are going through a very rigorous uh, educational model that you in many ways have created, um, that you would, um, bring to their attention 
uh, people who have taken a different course uh, and let them know that we're out there, right. uh, that it's possible. Um, that's, uh, that's th that there's a level of generosity there that goes beyond our, our friendship. I think it goes um, in, in, you know, to the very core of what you believe uh, um, as, a, as a creative person, uh, that there are many, many, many roads that uh, students who graduate from RPI will, will take, um, but they all should lead to places of innovation, of creativity, and of change. Um, and uh, I, 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 I thank you uh, for that. Um, it's not often uh, that I'm um, um, invited into uh, schools um, that, um, you know, would seem that my career would be an oddity, um, but I appreciate the fact that you um, are opening these different paths of ways of, of having a, a meaningful and impactful life uh, to your student's body. And I just hope, I hope one person uh, has been inspired uh, and will remember this. Uh, I'd be very, very lucky if we, if we could uh, produce uh, just one person who can look back on uh, this talk and say, you know, it made a difference in the trajectory of my, my, own, my own journey. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Maurice, I, I assure you many more than just one. Uh, but um, thank you. You thank and you. I will keep in touch. It's an ongoing conversation, uh, and I'm sure everyone just was blown away uh, by your remarks and your keen insight tonight. Have a wonderful night, and I'll be in touch with you shortly. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.